So I'm a theoretical physicist, so it's rather rare that I give lectures on philosophy, but I will explain later why I got interested in the subject. So the title is Plato and Modern Physics, and I will start with the quotation. The safest general characterization of the European philosophical tradition is that it consists of a series of footnotes to Plato. That was written by Alfred Whitehead in 1929 in the book Process and Reality. In the talk, I would like to argue that not only philosophy owes so much, as Whitehead emphasized, to Plato, but maybe, a little unexpectedly, physics. And more specifically, the talk will be devoted to an analogy between the difference of Plato's and Aristotle's thoughts, in general terms, objective idealism and empiricism, and the difference of paradigms between the Newtonian physics and the modern quantum mechanical and Einsteinian physics, as developed from the beginning of the 20th century. The mere existence of this analogy is striking, to say the least, Be bearing in mind that there are two, more, almost two and a half thousand years that separate these two phenomena. Plato lived, it is unknown where he was actually born, when he was actually born, it's roughly around 428. Uh, two dates are given, either 228 or 200, uh, 424. So he lived from 428 till 348 BC, and Aristotle 384 till 322 BC. And now we are talking about the change that happened 100 years ago. It is also amusing to note that the change that we are talking about was chronologically reversed uh, in both cases. Namely, Aristotle was a disciple of Plato, dominated the approach, Aristotle dominated the approach to physics for more than 2,000 years. And 100 years ago, as we will discuss in detail later, we returned in physics to the Plato's ideas. Obviously, the talk will give a very simplified account on both philosophical and physical sides of the story. But before we turn to the main theme, let us make some remarks. People are often inclined to think that the humanity makes progress in knowledge and understanding uh, in one direction, like entropy, it can only grow. This conviction sometimes uh, acquires totally ridiculous forms, as, for example, in the times of the French Revolution, with its contempt and absolute disregard to what was achieved earlier, to the point that it was then decided that the years should, be started, should start to be counted anew. I have in my library a French book from these times with the printed year number on the cover, too. In the next century, uh, Karl Marx, after Friedrich Hegel, formulated the thesis of a constant progress of social laws and forms of organization, proceeding along the helix and reaching infinite understanding and infinite perfection at the end. Unfortunately, the 20th century witnessed a dramatic failure of this conjecture. In our times, we still have traces of such a thinking, even in science, by usually working only on the most recent ideas, quoting only the most recent papers. Also, grant policy usually requires the most recent references to the area of research that we propose in the grant. Otherwise, the chances of success of getting the grant are very slim. However, I hope we appreciate now more honestly the achievements of even very remote predecessors. Before we discuss the achievements of Greek thought, let us discuss the process, which is very extremely important in physics, of so-called idealization. 
that is so characteristic to the modern physics. For any physical description of, say, a ball on an inclined plane, we have to strip the whole process of a huge number of properties that do not have any impact, or at least we suspect they have a negligible impact on the process we want to describe. For the ball, one can list, for example, a color of the ball, name of the owner, its price, and millions of other features connected to the ball that apparently are irrelevant for physics. And one leaves only several numbers, like moment of inertia, its radius, uh, friction coefficient, angle of the plane, all those that are judged uh, as sufficient to describe the process in uh, physical terms. Then these few numbers are used to predict, using mathematical operations that are dictated by the laws of physics, the outcome of the experiment, and the numbers are translated back into the real world. The stripping of irrelevant features and translation of the real world into numbers is called idealization and plays a fundamental role in any physical description. One should really be amazed how effectively this reduction works and how little is needed for the precise description of the physical side of any phenomenon. On the other hand, it also points to how much drops out from this description that can be important or even crucial for other purposes. Coming back to the achievements of our predecessors, the most underestimated seems to be the Hellenic period, approximately from the death of Alexander the Great in 323 BC to the destruction of Syracuse and murdering Archimedes in 212 BC. Even now, we quote the measurement of the Earth's circumference by Eratosthenes, which lived 276 till 194 BC, by the way, unbelievably precise, usually without deeper thinking what such a measurement really required. Eratosthenes actually had to employ fully the process of idealization that we described a minute ago. He had to treat the real Earth as a geometric ball, know that Alexandria and Siena, which is now called Aswan in Egypt, have similar longitude, although he was probably aware of a few degrees of the difference. He had to put the sun very far away, use geometric relation of parallel lines on two different latitudes on the sphere, solve the geometric problem, and at the end, translate the result of the calculation into the real 250,000 stadii, extremely close to the actual 40,000 kilometers. One could quote many such examples. Hipparchus, 190, 120 BC, with his very large catalog of stars, used, by the way, by uh, Ptolemy three centuries later. From then we have the Ptolemaean system. Ctesibius from Alexandria, uh, who lived 285, 222 BC, father of pneumatics, inventor of precise water clock, the best time measuring device for the next 2,000 years. And uh, elaboration on the atmospheric pressure introduced by Empedocles. See, for example, uh, Lucio Rosso, La Rivoluzione Dimenticata, for dozens of other examples. Unfortunately, these authors are only mentioned in very few scattered sources, mostly secondhand. Even the Euclid's Elements, uh, the most famous mathematical book ever written, is known from the ninth century. That means 12 centuries after it was, the original book was written. 
The fact that originals were lost stems probably from the fact that the later generations, starting from the Romans, were generally unable to understand the sophisticated ways of logic and reasoning that the Greek used. And the Greek originals were either completely neglected uh, or quoted mutilated, I will give an example later, to the now seemingly ridiculous forms or just destroyed as it happened twice, at least twice, uh, in the first and third century of our AD, with the library of Alexandria burned by the Romans, at least twice, probably more. As an example, one can quote the fact that was known in Hellenic times that bees use hexagon construction in honeycombs because with a given circumference covering a plane with hexagons has the biggest area to circumference ratio. It was explicitly said in, in Hellenic uh, sources. So it needs the least amount of walks to build. Uh, in the later quotation from Plinius from Roman times, it is written that the bees use hexagons because hexagons are best adapted to the six legs of a bee. As a digression, let us mention that Kepler in his book, very nice book by the way, Six Cornered Snowflake, undertook the subject uh, almost 2,000 years later asking the question what should be the angle between three rhombi that of the end cup uh, in the honeycomb to have the largest volume with the smallest amount of wax needed. And he came to the conclusion that the bee cell should have uh, 109 degrees 29 minutes between the rhombi as it is actually observed in actual honeycombs with obviously sm some small deviations in the real honeycombs. However, it is now known that more complex end caps with hexagons and squares are possible that give even better ratio, but they are much more complicated. The problem of the best end cap is not solved till today. I have to confess that my interest in Plato's thought is not purely academic but it has also a personal origin. My grand-grandfather, Vincente Lutosławski, the uncle of Witold Lutosławski, the famous composer, was a great admirer of Pla Plato, knew fluently the Old Greek and incidentally 13 other languages, and studied for many years the Plato's dialogues and has written a book, The Origin and Growth of Pla Plato's Logic, that's the first page of this book, that was published in London in 1897. In this book, written in Spain, in La Coruña, his wife and my grand-grandmother was Sofia Casanova, a Spanish poet and writer, by the scrupulous analysis of the language of the dialogue, he was able to establish their chronology and describe in detail the evolution of the Plato's thought. And that is the book that I was reading from I, when I was rather a young person. It is really miraculous that the entire written heritage of Plato was preserved. And we actually uh, know of no Plato's dialogue that was anywhere mentioned or cited, but the text itself disappeared. This situation is very rare indeed. Among the ancient Greek philosophers, for example, earlier Democritus, famous for the conjecture of the existence of atoms, is known to have written 60 works, none of which survived. The works of the above-mentioned authors of the Hellenic period are, as we said, extremely scarce. Even the Aristotle philosophical output is known with much less completeness than Plato's. The reason for this amazing fact of full preservation is not fully understood. It probably stems from an almost religious attitude of the disciples of the Plato's academia to the heritage of the founding father. For many centuries, 
actually at least 24 after the Plato's death. The difference between the modern meaning of academia, founded by Plato, and Lyceum, founded by Aristotle, reflects the relative importance of the both contribution to contemporaries. However, starting from the Middle Ages, when the Aristotle's work has been rediscovered till the end of the 19th century, his empiricism had much greater influence on the philosophy and science than Plato's objective idealism. The latter, the idealism of Plato, was reintroduced to science mostly by Einstein at the beginning of the 20th century and remains the leading attitude in the theoretical fundamental science ever since. In philosophy and theology, this change is yet to come, although it seems clear that neither Aristotle nor Plato are at present really fully understood. We start with some recollection <clears throat> of the Plato's ideas. The early Plato's dialogues, like Protagoras or Gorgias, <clears throat> start from, question, from questions that Plato himself attributed to Socrates. What is real? What is knowledge? What is the difference between knowledge and opinion? What are the basics that no one can deny? At the later stage, starting with Republic, through Phaedrus and Symposium, and within 50 years of his activity, he developed the notion of objective idealism. What we observe is actually less real than what lies behind the observed world. The objective ideas do not have to possess their emanations in the observable world to be called and treated as real. Conversely, we observe the quote-unquote real world because there are ideas behind and nothing can exist without the underlying idea. Moreover, the observed world gives a very imprecise and blurred representation of the ideas that lie behind. And the world of ideas is much more, presently we would say infinitely more, but he didn't use the term. They are infinitely or much more ideal than anything we can observe. In Philebus, Plato explicitly says that natural science is deficient in exactness because it does not refer to eternal ideas but to changing appearances, which are in time, not in eternity, and they can never become an object of absolute knowledge. This view was emphasized in Timaeus, which deals chiefly with natural sciences, by the way. We may have some access to this quote-unquote ideal world, but it requires a specially trained mind and courage to turn around, as in the famous allegory of the cave. And only then we can start to gain the real knowledge. Knowledge refers to the eternal ideas, while opinion to changing appearances. This set of notions <clears throat> was questioned by Aristotle, who claimed that empirical evidence is the most fundamental. Existence is equivalent to the existence in the real and observable world. And the abstract ideas and categories that he introduced himself are useful, but by no means fundamental in our description and understanding of the world. This Aristotle's approach, together with his fundamental contribution to logic and the theory of reasoning, turned out to be extremely effective in the development of experimental physics over the centuries and to perfection of the scientific method. However, it had its limitations in our theoretical understanding 
at the fundamental level as we try to discuss, discuss in a minute. We now turn to physics and its evolution over the last five centuries. The enormous progress achieved uh, from, from then, from the beginning, from the Middle Ages, started in the Middle Ages, actually. This period is now grossly underestimated, mostly because of intentionally negative attitude in the Age of Enlightenment towards the Middle Ages. The progress from then on, triggered in a substantial way by rediscovering Hellenic sources, it was exactly at that time, was mainly due to the development of the scientific method and gathering in a systematic way both observations and, with growing importance, the results of plant experiments. One could add here that more of the half of presently used liver drugs come from the Middle Ages. The approach was based on the search for correlations among the rapidly growing body of observations, using also the antique ones that were rediscovered shortly before. This experimental approach was dominant all over uh, through, through four centuries, let's say, and the attempts to create a mathematical description and only then explain the observations and predict the new ones was very rare and concerned only the greatest giants, like Copernicus, Kepler, Galileo, Newton, or Maxwell. But even then, they were trying to explain only visible observations by mathematical relations between the observed objects. The attitude that observations are everything what exists, whatever that means. And the only purpose of physics is to find these mathematical relations between observable and measurable phenomena stems directly from the empiricism of Aristotle. All objects discussed then were observable and it seemed that there is no need for ontological questions whether the, objects whether the object exists and in what sense. Kepler used, for example, the Tycho Brahe observations of planets, by the way, incredibly precise, without any need to ask whether planets exist. Maxwell treated the electric and magnetic fields in a mechanical way as perfectly existing objects. The most notable exception is Galileo, who indirectly introduced the notion, that is also not directly visible, of a reference frame. But it is known that he studied carefully the Hellenic sources mentioned above. In the 19th century, three great branches of physics were known. Mechanics, now called classical, thermodynamics, now converted into statistical physics, and electrodynamics, now called classical. All those were connected with beautiful mathematics. Classical mechanics with variational calculus, thermodynamics with differential forms, and classical electrodynamics with the theory of partial differential equations. The success of these theories in explaining the whole body of observations available then, led Albert Michelson in 1894 to claim that physicists discovered everything important what was to be discovered and the rest belongs to engineers. The situation, as we very well know, changed dramatically at the beginning of the 20th century. Seemingly innocuous facts like stability of atoms, black body radiation spectrum, naive questions like why is it dark at night with the deceptively obvious answer led to the fundamental change in our understanding and the whole approach to the physical world. 
Although Planck made a very strange assumption about absorption and emission of electromagnetic waves in 1900 that led to his famous black body spectrum curve, it is the introduction of Einstein of the notion of Licht quanta, the name photon came almost 20 years later. He introduced this notion in 1905, and it marks the beginning of, using the Armstrong words, the giant leap for mankind, namely formation of quantum mechanics. After some preliminary constructions, like Bohr's model of atoms or Sommerfeld rules, the real breakthrough was born out of pure thought, as I would like to emphasize, in the Heisenberg, Jordan, and Born papers. Shortly later, the formulation of Schrodinger followed. Till now, the ontological question is unsolved. In what sense the objects in quantum mechanics, like wave function, exist? On one hand, they are unobservable in any direct way. This especially concerns the phase of the wave function. But on the other, govern everything what can be observed. They are subject to relations, like internal symmetries, that do not have direct rep representations in the observable world, yet they lead to physical laws that can be measured and verified. To illustrate this point, let us take the standard model, describing up to presently available energies, all interactions except gravity. It is generally based on the chiral gauge symmetry group. Sorry for technical terms, but I want to illustrate the point. SU3 color times SU2 weak times uh, U1 hypercharge. Having this information and the particle content, plus some technical details like renormalizability, one could uniquely reproduce the action for the theory, and with some amount of work, product predict the uh, results of collision at the Large Hadron Collider. However, neither chirality nor the gauge groups with the notions of color and hypercharge can be directly observed. They are purely theoretical concepts. On the contrary, the very notion of a gauge group is based on the idea that the group connects the configurations that correspond to the same physical observation that cannot be distinguished. We could analyze for decades the results of the collision at the LHC, and we wouldn't invent the standard model. That was constructed theoretically using, as I emphasized, the pure thought. The situation has a direct analogy with the Plato's notion of an objective idea and its emanation in the observable world. The same concerns theory of gravity, a general theory of relativity of Einstein. The equations that he wrote cannot be observed and remain, uh, that they, they was, were not conceived to directly explain observations. His famous Gedanken experimentum suggested a symmetry in the ideal world and not in the real world. And this symmetry, by the way, cannot be observed and remains purely theoretical. And this theoretical symmetry dictated the form of the equations in a unique way, actually. At the time of writing, Einstein didn't know what, that these equations describe black holes, expansion of the universe, gravitational waves, and in fact, all known gravitational phenomena some of which were discovered much, much later. It is this symmetry, this theoretical symmetry, that dictated in a unique way the form of the equations. On one hand, this fact points to the existence of objective ideas, but on the other, to the amazing fact that by pure thought, if exercised by a genius, of course, we can gain some insight into the world of these ideas. To illustrate the already mentioned difficulty of going from observation to the underlying law of physics, let us give an example. 
also not fundamental, but extremely important. Namely, discovery of high temperature superconductors in 1986 by Bednosch and Müller. The discovery was not preceded by a theory, by any theory. And until now, after more than 30 years, or exactly 30 years, and thousands of experiments, we still don't have a theory of high temperature superconductors. It is of fundamental importance to notice that we cannot change anything in the laws of physics. We can just try to discover and understand them. Therefore, these laws transcend us and point to the deeper level that is not contained in the observable world that surrounds us. As we already emphasize, the, at this point, the Aristotle's empirical approach is replaced by the Plato's objective idealism. We now treat the laws of physics as independent entities satisfying their own relations without necessity to be realized in an observable way. Also, we hope that the relevant laws of physics that are there to govern what we observe are nevertheless realized in nature and their consequences can, at least in principle, be observed. Let us remark that these laws do not explain or justify themselves and their existence is a complete analogy to the Platonic objective ideas. Such a justification would need a different metaphysical origin. As Plotinus says, the maker of both reality and substance is beyond both reality and substance. As argued by Lutosławski, Plato's, Plato's dialogues witness not one change of thought from Socratean to the objective idealism, but also the second one, from objective idealism to the theory of soul and description of the transcendent element in ideas, as can be seen in the last dialogue, Timaeus. The very last dialogue, loss, is of different nature. The first change has its analogy in physics, as we try to argue, as a monumental effort over the centuries of transition from classical to modern physics. The second would mean a transition from physics to metaphysics, and as such belongs to philosophy or theology rather than physics. In the final stage of Plato's thoughts, as uh, discussed in Timaeus, he stated that the ideas are not independent, as he claimed previously, but exist within the all overwhelming spirit. In his words, it was called the good. In the Plotinus words, it would be called the one. By entering the world of ideas, we in fact touch the transcendence that is far above our ability to understand. It is probably safe to say that the effort of transition from Aristotelian metaphysics to the Platonic one as in the analogous transition in physics, could transform philosophy and theology as deeply as it transformed physics. But this effort seemingly has not yet been seriously undertaken. Thank you very much. I think that there is yet one great Greek thinker which should be mentioned in this context, Archimedes. Absolutely. Yeah. Because uh, historians of science uh, say that there are three, in fact, three uh, scientific, so to speak, scientific traditions in the Greek thought. Uh, uh, Platonic tradition, Aristotelian tradition, as you have described them, and also the Archimedean uh, tradition. Uh, Archim Archimedes was a predecessor of the modern Absolutely. physical method. He started with measuring some, some uh, phenomena in the real world, in the field of static, for instance, and then he constructed mathematical models of that, and then may, he made a prediction what should be ne measured next. Mm -hmm. In fact, he also described its, uh, his own method in a manuscript which was discovered at the beginning of the 20th century, 
so I think this third tradition, but well, uh, he was somehow forgotten by historians for some time because he claimed, he himself, Archimedes, that he's continued Platonic tradition. So Plato was so, so much venerated at that time. But in fact, uh, we owe a, a lot of things to Archimedes. And the corroboration of that is that you, if you open the modern handbook of physics, it starts with the simple laws discovered by Archimedes, mm -hmm. which is something wonderful. Thank you. Thank you for this comment. Thank you very much. More questions? Just uh, to add to these uh, three traditions, uh, there is a fourth one, the, pre, uh, the Ionian, Greek Ionian uh, tradition, uh, which um, is very important because, uh, well, it's different from Aristotle because they considered that the body is infinite and not finite. And Aristotle uh, criticized this position. But now science, uh, it seems to me that goes back to the Ionian, Greek Ionian tradition where the body is infinite and is composed of an inf the infinite body. The, I would say the example of an infinite body is the infinite universe. And the infinite universe is an infinite sequence of universes. So we have, uh, we don't need the concept of multiverse. We have already the concept of uh, universe, which is both one and infinitely many. So uh, now science, it seems that it goes towards this uh, Greek Ionian uh, tradition, which was forgotten by empirical science based on the analytic logic of Aristotle. This is my comment to Thank you very uh, much. Heller. Yes. Thank you. Um, so your talk was about the, um, the, the particular Plato and Aristotelian traditions. Could you comment a little bit about perhaps non-Western tradition and how that influences science today? Perhaps like uh, Iranian, you mentioned the Middle Ages without mentioning anything about uh, uh, yeah, okay. non-Western. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, I, I know much, much less about that. But uh, I uh, talk to people that know much more than me, infinitely more than me, about, for example, uh, the tradition in India or Indian thought. Uh, less about Chinese thought that I know less, but about the Indian thought, why in India, who was extremely advanced in observations, in all this, and then um, depth of thought and so on, why the science was not, in a sense, in the modern sense of the world, it was not created then? And, uh, of course, there are probably many, many reasons, but one of them is that, uh, at least I, I quote my, my friend, who is a specialist in Indian, uh, he spent in India many years and so on, that uh, at some point in the tradition, in the Indian tradition, it was grammatic who was the most important thing and not mathematics. So the, the in a sense, relation between words and the composition of words and so on, and not the exact uh, numbers. Numbers were less interesting for them than the, uh, the, let's say, relations between words, between meanings, and so on. And that's why they didn't develop any mathematical, strict mathematical, let's say, uh, tradition or description of the world, because it was less interesting for them, the re exact relations between, you know, m material world, than the relations between the meanings, the words, and so on. So that's probably the reason, but you know, I can only quote my friend who, who spent several years in Benares uh, studying this, and he said that grammat so they were very advanced in the relations between the, the meanings, what is inside the meaning, what is outside, what is a definition, and so on, but not the mm, math mathematical relations between the objects. So maybe that's the reason, but I, I, I cannot say more. About the Chinese tradition, I, I have nothing to say except that they were absolutely brilliant in observations, you know, paper, you know, powder, and, and so on, um, uh, all the maritime, uh, and, uh, but, but they didn't create science in the, in the sense, I don't know, that I don't know why. In the, with the Indian, I have a little bit of knowledge from my friend, so that's, that, that's how I can comment on that.